Good morning. <coughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, this is officially the last lecture for this course, but as I wrote to you on uh, Piazza, I will give another lecture in this room on Friday uh, to talk about things we didn't have time to talk about. So it's just a, just a fun lecture. But at the end, we might talk about you might review material, so if you're motivated by that, come for that. If you prefer to hear the new stuff, come for that. Uh, and it's recorded, so you can watch it later. Okay, uh, I want to talk about non-parametric learning today. <clears throat> it's a very uh, broad <coughs> area of machine learning that um, is quite um, commonly used and quite popular um, and quite different than most of what we've done until now. In the last few weeks, or last few lectures at least, I switched from talking about learning a function from some input space, x, to some output, into learning a joint distribution. That's what we did with graphical models. I'm going to now switch back to the traditional view of there's a clear input and there's a clear output. So I'm going back to learning a mapping from a set of covariates to a single output. That mapping could be classification, in which case y is uh, a random variable over some categories, um, or it could be regression, in which case y is distribution over real numbers. Okay, we're gonna work with both. Um, for notation, uh, every Input would be a little x with a bar on it to remind us that it's a vector. It's a vector of this many covariates. So x bar sub i um, is going to stand for a single input vector with p values, one for each one of the covariates. For demonstration, I will use the case where p equals 2 because that's what I can draw on the board. So I'm going to work with two dimensions. By the way, we often use, okay, two dimensions, so p is going to be equal to two. So every input would correspond to a point on the board. And I'm further going to um, sometimes work with uh, binary classification. So if we have binary classification, so if the space of all possible y's, which I will write like this, is two, or maybe I'll write it a little more clearly. If y takes on the values plus and minus, then <coughs> every label data point can be drawn by just putting its label on the board. There's a coordinate system somewhere here, and then this is a single labeled input. This is its x1 value. This is its x2 value. And the label is positive. And similarly, I could have another positive here, and a negative here, and a negative here, and a negative here, and a negative here, and a positive here. I have a whole bunch of them. So I represent my training examples by labeled points in a two-dimensional, in this case, two-dimensional space. What we've done with this kind of setup before is we imposed a bias, a hard, um, a hard bias in advance. For example, we said, let's consider all linear classifiers. So we restricted our attention to all straight lines. And now the question only became, where do we put the straight line? What is the orientation and what is the offset? We impose the hard bias. We will not consider any separation line uh, that is not a straight line. And we will not consider any classification that cannot be expressed by a straight line. We're not going to do that now. We're not going to pre-impose a hard bias. What we're going to do instead is, in a sense, nothing. We're going to just note where the points are. 
So the training stage of what we're going to do is doing training. Do nothing. We're going to push off all the work to the test stage. The test or evaluation stage, we will be given a data point um, that we need to classify. Call it X test. Let's say here. And we ask to classify it. We're going to ask, we're going to look around for who is the nearest neighbor of that point. Which of our labeled examples are closest to it? Gosh, I put it in a bad place. This is a hard decision between these two. No problem, we'll move it. Say it's here. Well, let's say it's here. Of all the labeled examples, the nearest to this one is this. So we will label this as positive. Very simple. It's called the nearest neighbor algorithm. Just find the nearest label and follow what it says. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Much nicer if you can find like the 10 nearest neighbors and the average or the weighted average of what they are. You prefer that we base the decision on not the one nearest neighbor but 10 nearest neighbors or k nearest neighbors. Why? So then you can take, take the closest one and say that's weighted heavier, but then you get, you know, it's 80% that is positive, 20%. Why is it better? Why do you get a better confidence estimate? Because you're accounting for not just the closest neighbor, but the second closest neighbor, the third closest neighbor. So like if, if the ten closest neighbors are all positive, then you're 100% positive that it's positive. But if there's a negative in there, then you're maybe 90%. All right, so um, let's suppose our point was, um, what do we have here? One, two, three, four, and two, three. Let's say our point is um, here. Using your method of 10 nearest neighbors, the 10 nearest neighbors are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Seven nearest neighbors. Uh, four of them are negative and three are positive. If I take a vote, I would say it's negative. Whereas if I put a point out there, the answer would also be negative. In fact, the answer everywhere would be negative. So I'm saying you should say that the answer is you're 60% positive, 60% positive. Okay, I, I hear you. I mean, it's definitely a more, a more refined answer. You don't want to give a, a, a complete one way or the other answer. You want to give a weighted answer. But if you're forced to give a, for, even in that case, the answer would always be four out of seven negative and, f and, four out of, and three out of seven positive. So it'll give the same answer everywhere. It doesn't sound that great. Um, and second, if, if you're forced to give a, a single label answer, then you will always give a negative answer, right? I like everything so, you said. I'm just giving you a hard time. You realize well, that. So, so, but if you get into the middle of those points, you would uh -huh. weight the closer neighbors heavier and farther neighbors. Ah, okay. So you're going to weigh them. Okay. You're, you're running a little bit ahead of me, uh, but you're right. Let me start by this, the simplest thing, which is just take some fixed number of neighbors, K neighbors. Okay? That's called the K nearest neighbor algorithm. It's very similar to the original one nearest neighbor algorithm. So. K nearest neighbor um, means that the label um, label of the test point is I can write it as argmax, I can write it as majority vote 
Okay. Nearest neighbors. If you now restrict yourself to just thinking about the K, the standard conventional K nearest neighbor algorithm, my question to you is, what value of K should you choose? The very first attempt I made was equal to K equals one. X, I'm sorry? Uh, no, K nearest neighbors among all the training examples of this point. So the label we will assign to this point, to X test here, would be the majority vote among, if K were three, the three nearest neighbors would be probably this one, this one, and this one. The majority vote, these two would vote for negative, this would vote for positive, the majority vote would be negative. If k were 5, well, if it were 4, then I could have a balance. So I might prefer k that's odd, right? Um, if it were 5, it will pick up this one and maybe this one too. So the label might reverse. So which k you choose can affect your answer. And my question to you is, what is a good k? What's wrong with k equals 1? Okay, go ahead. Um, we could choose k depending on the data we have so like the, uh, how correct it fits. We can just divide the uh, we can divide the data into two pieces and then the second piece can be used to evaluate if we are choosing the num the number k correctly. So you're saying we can use cross validation uh, to help us practically find uh, the k that will give us the highest accuracy. Yeah, we can certainly do that. Before you do cross-validation, um, I'd like to understand the trade-offs that are involved in making K larger or smaller. Yeah? Ah, so there's different behavior, thank you, different behavior uh, with regard to how the algorithm would handle noise. If K is one, and then one nearest neighbor, by noise we mean errors in the data. Either error in the label or error in where the points are located, namely in the, in the inputs. <coughs> if k equals one, we can see how error in the data may result <coughs> in bad classification more easily. All it takes is for the nearest neighbor to have the wrong label. Let's say, 10% of our inputs have wrong labels. Then, on average, 10% of the time you try to label a new point, its nearest neighbor would have a wrong label, in which case it would be labeled wrongly. You might think it's unavoidable, but if you move to a higher K, um, then if, if you move to a K of, let's say, 11, then you're more likely that the majority of the labels would be the true majority of the labels. And if you have seven to four, um, the chances that multiple labels were mislabeled is quite small. Okay, so that's, um, that's argument about the error in the labels. If there's error in the inputs, if you think of the exact locations of these data points as not being exactly where they're listed, but kind of being jittered a little bit around it. If you use k equals one, the identity of the nearest neighbor might change. You know, the nearest neighbor might be somebody else. But if you use k equals 11, um, again, most of these 11 would remain, the 11 um, nearest neighbors in your data would be close to, highly overlap the true 11 nearest neighbors. So there is robustness in numbers. There is safety in numbers. We call that the opposite of that variance. There's another aspect of variance here. The data came from a sample, the training examples. There's presumably a larger distribution of possible inputs out there, and we sample the training examples from them. There is some 
um, luck that goes with the luck of the draw of what sample we got. So if we base our decisions on a single nearest neighbor, that decision might change for the same X point, the same test point. That answer might change depending on the luck of the sample that we got. Much more so than if we base it on a larger set of neighbors. So I will capture all of that with, by saying they, that when k is small, we get high variance. Usually when we talk about variance in context of machine learning or statistical estimation, we mean how the answer varies as the sample changes. As a different sample comes from the same distribution but a different sample. So that captures the last scenario that I just mentioned. But here I also mean high variance and high sensitivity to error, to noise. Noise, name the error. Okay, so you convinced me that I shouldn't go with k that's too small. What about making k very large? The larger we make it, the lower the variance, the lower the sensitivity to noise, why not make it a million and one? Yeah? You'll always give the same answer. If, I mean, in the extreme case, if you use all of them, then you're never going to give a different answer. It's always just going to be a majority vote over the entire sample. Okay, if, uh, if I go to the extreme of k equals the number of training examples I have, then I will always give the same answer. <clears throat> so, okay, let's make k half of the examples I have. Now I don't have the same answer everywhere. Yeah. Um, I guess, like, it, like, you're kind of assuming that, like, neighbors influence um, the point. So if you're going to go for a high k, then you're going to get neighbors that are, like, pretty far away from that point. Like, I guess, like, in space or whatever. Um, so then, like, farther away neighbors don't have as much influence on that point than closer near neighbors, which is what will happen if you keep your k smaller. So you're saying that if k is very large, it's equivalent to saying that far away neighbors can also have influence on the data point. Why shouldn't they? I'm sorry? I appreciate you including the word depends in there. Thank you. Um, all right, what do others think? Yeah? You, too much computation, you're saying? That is true. You may, we'll talk about computation in a minute, but I'd like to uh, ignore for a moment the computational considerations. Talk only about the sort of uh, accuracy issue. What is most likely to uh, lead to higher accuracy? Soft bias, because you assume your soft bias with the nearest thing is nearest, like point next to the point you're evaluating is what you what the answer is. So if you look at more points that are further away, you lose that soft bias. Uh, you're saying that if you lose at more points further away, you lose the soft bias. I would modify it and say you change the bias. Um, it's certainly not the same as if as the bias if you chose k equals one. But I'm trying to just put my hand on exactly what that bias is and what do you lose by making it bigger? Yeah? Overfitting? Overfitting by making k large? I don't see that because in the limit at least, when k is extremely large, uh, the function becomes constant. It's always the same answer, right? So what, let's take that. Let's suppose k was not uh, the entire data set but half the size of the data set. So for every point, find half of the training data that's closest to it and base a decision on that. What kind of a function would that give us? What can you tell me about the properties of that classification function? Suppose I have the board full of training examples and I map every point on the board to the majority vote of the of the half half of the training examples that are closest to it. Yeah. 
think it would be like a linear cut between the data. So like if you have like two like concentrations of points, then like you would you get like this like line. Do you think there would be one separation boundary in between them? Anybody wants to agree, disagree? You disagree? Um, so if the data points are even distributed among each other, they're scattered among each other, then there won't be a useful. All right, so a counterexample would be when the, ex the positive and negatives are interspersed uniformly. So let's go back to the formulation we had earlier that should faraway neighbors matter? I think you would agree with me that if the answer is no, that only near neighbors should matter, um, then we should use a smaller k. Because if we use a large k, we're going out further to, um, to collect those, those k nearest neighbors, and then they influence us uh, maybe too much. But if faraway neighbors should matter, then maybe you should go to a higher k. What do you think about the following situation? Um, you have lots of So you have a strong concentration of training examples in one area, and then in other areas it's very sparse. What does that do to our choice of K? Yeah? Would you ask what our test point is? So if our test point is there, we want K to be higher than if it's over Oh, that's a good point. If, if our test point is here, we might want K to be higher than if our test point is here. Why? Because if k is higher over here, then we like consider those test points as a kind of True. One way of saying it, maybe flipping it around, is if our test point is here, we don't need to go very far to get a robust number of neighbors to make a majority decision on. Whereas if we're here, we don't have a choice. We have to go further out if we want robustness, if we want to reduce variance. But I would feel less confident about my choice here than my choice there. So the issue is not, what we're trying to do is not minimize k. We're actually trying to maximize k, but we're trying to keep the distance of the points as, as small as possible, right? Ideally, we want to have lots of neighbors that are really neighbors, that are really clear, nearby. Sometimes we're in a situation where we can achieve that if we have a lot of nearby points. Sometimes we're in a situation where we have to make maybe painful decisions how far out to go. We might feel that if we go too far out, um, it's less relevant. The, 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 the label of this point here is maybe less relevant to a test point here. Underlying all of this is our soft bias assumption. What is our underlying assumption in all of this? What is our soft bias? Can you help me come up with a um, way of expressing it. Huh? We prefer shorter distances. That's a more, we prefer shorter distances. That's more of a rule than it's, um, I'm looking for a formulation that um, captures our assumption. What is our assumption about the underlying function that we're trying to learn? Will this method work for all functions? Definitely not. What kind of functions will it work for? That's another way of saying, what is the assumption we're making? Huh? Uh, examples that have closer points in terms of feature tends to have the same model. Yeah, nearby points tend to have the same label. That's an assumption. It's, not, it's, so, it's such a, uh, a natural assumption that we may not even think to make it, but those of you who are mathematicians uh, would, would know that a random function doesn't satisfy that 
that requirement. It's a form of continuity. Although with the classification, the function is not really continuous, but it's like the classification equivalence of continuity. Um, that when you change the location of your input by a small amount, most of the time, the label does not change. <coughs> we can even quantify it by saying the probability of a change in the label is very <coughs> small when the change in the input is small. Nearby points tend to have the same label. Uh, first, by 10 to, I don't mean that the function is stochastic, although it could be. What I mean is that if I repeat the experiment many, many times, I draw randomly a point and then randomly another point that's very close to it, and I compare the labels, most of the time, the labels will agree. And I, quanti I can quantify it in terms of the distance between the points and what fraction of the time they agree. In fact, I could do that on my training examples. <coughs> I can measure distance between two training examples, call it XA and XB. These are drawn, one of them is drawn randomly from the training example, the other one is drawn to be, well, let's draw them both randomly. They're both drawn randomly, I measure the distance between them, and here I draw the fraction of the time that they agree, the labels agree. Percent of the time the label agrees. What I expect is a decreasing function, something like this. I don't know exactly the shape or the, you know, how fast it drops, but I expect that the highest they can agree, of course, is 100% of the time. I expect that when the two points are very close to each other, the labels <clears throat> will be very close almost always. And then when they're far away from each other, it'll drop to some base level, having to do with the distribution of positives and negatives, you know, the fraction of positives and negatives in training the data. And somewhere in between, what I generally expect, this is the assumption I'm making, is that as the points uh, get further further from each other, the agreement level goes down. The important thing to me is the agreement limit is pretty high here. Now it could be that when I do this experiment and I tally it, I get something like this. Which is another way of saying that this is the relevant distance. Nobody says it has to be linear, right? Or any particular parametric form. So instead of choosing k, let me talk in terms of distance. Going back, of course, to your suggestion, but I wanted to have this discussion first. So my more general um, way of ex expressing this bias or this assumption is to weigh all the data points but to weigh them differently based on their distance. So the classification, call it non-parametric classification, is take vote among all data points, all training examples, points, <coughs> 
but weigh them differently. based on distance. The weight of point x i, this is an index over training examples, should be somehow related to the distance between point x i and our test point. And it should be related in an inverse way. The larger the distance, uh, the smaller the weight. For example, I could make it 1 over distance squared. I don't have to. I could use any other function I want, but it better be a function that decreases with increased distance to capture this idea um, that we have drawn over there. Um, I could use the same idea instead of classification for regression. <laughs> for regression, the y is a number. And instead of taking a majority vote with different weights, I'm going to take an average with different weights. So it's going to be a weighted average. So y of x test would be a weighted, a weighted sum of the x, xi's where i's goes over the training data. And it's going to be weighted Let me make sure that this is a function of both xi and x test. So this is b w of xi x test. And here it's the same thing w of xi and x test times xi times not xi, yi. And here it's just normalization, w of xi, x test. i goes over all training examples. So this is just a weighted average. Every point is weighted by its weight function, which, for example, could be 1 over the square distance. Because distance is positive, I can even make it just 1 over distance. I don't even have to put it in, in uh, absolute value. So I can make it without this. Or I can make it square root of distance. If I think that um, the dependence is really strong, namely that points that are up to some point matter, and then later they almost don't matter at all, I can make the dependence even stronger. For example, I can make it e to the <coughs> negative the distance squared. And in fact, if I make that negative distance over some kind of a 2 sigma squared, e to the negative that, I deliberately made it look like a Gaussian. This embodies the assumption that the relevance of every data point to another data point drops very fast, like a Gaussian. It's going to be non-negligible when the distance is roughly in the same order of magnitude as the sigma. One sigma, two sigmas, still meaningful. Three, four, five sigma, it's negligible, right? This is equivalent to saying that the dependence here 
looks like this. The right half of a Gaussian. And the sigma is about this far. So we found another language for expressing bias, expressing soft bias. It's the language of how distance affects probability of similarity, or in this case, it's not similarity, it's this, this underlying assumption in regression is that the value of every point is more or less the weighted average of its neighbors. But how weighted is determined by this weight? I want to stop this line of thinking for a moment and talk about computation a little. Um, in these methods, I mentioned that you don't have to do almost anything when you uh, train the model. There is really no process of training the model. Um, all you have to do is store all the, all the inputs because you may need any of them when you try to look up who's, who are the neighbors, right? Um, so you need a lot of storage. So during the training phase, let's write it somewhere else. Let's talk about computation. During the training phase, no computation, but no computation, but lots of storage. I say lots of storage because if we took the exact same training examples and same labels, let's say in the case of regression, and trained linear regression, we would have to do some computation. At the end, we will end up with P beta values. And that's the only thing we will need to store. In this method, we have to store the entire training set. It could be billions of data points. So that's a significant difference. With linear regression and other methods, including, say, neural networks, where it's also a form of parametric uh, regression, in neural networks, you have more parameters, as many parameters as there are weights, weights and biases. But when you're done with the training, all you need to keep is the weights of the network. You don't need to keep the original training examples. Whereas here, you need to keep the original training examples. Now, during test time, if we're doing k nearest neighbor with a fixed k, we need to find out who the k nearest neighbors are. And that may take some computation, especially if you have a large amount of training data. You <laughs> need to go over all your training data. So it's at least linear in the amount of training data. And then for each data point, you have to calculate its distance from the current point, And that distance is based on p dimensions. Right? Let me write the formula for distance. Distance from xi to x test is a sum over all the dimensions, d goes from 1 to p, <coughs> of the square distance from xi, comma, p to x test, comma, p squared. And then we have to take a square root of that. We have to do that for every one of our training examples. And this is computation of order p. So it would be order n times p computation. When n is large, that's quite a bit of computation for executing the function, classifying or, or, um, uh, or regressing may not be too much computation during training time, but if you have to do it every time you use the function, that's a lot relative to regression, linear regression or neural networks, 
where the amount of computation does not depend on how much training you had, training data you had to start with. So we've shifted the computation, we've shifted the burden, computation burden, from the training time to the test time. This is called lazy evaluation. Lazy evaluation is a term taken from computer science that means don't do any computation before you have to. Even if you're asked to do it, if you're not asked to print the result, don't do it. Wait until you're actually asked to print the result. You can also call it just-in-time computation. The contrast to lazy evaluation is called eager evaluation. So one computational difference between this method and the methods we discussed until now is that th these methods tend to be lazy. I say tend to be, but don't have to be. There are actually ways that you can shift some of the calculation back into training time to change back the balance of how much you compute in training time and how much you compute in test time. And that is by pre-processing your training examples into a form that's convenient later to look up the nearest neighbors. So there are a variety of methods for doing that. You can build trees and tries and heaps and there are lots of clever uh, data structures that you could use that will take quite a bit of work up front, but then would make it easier or faster for you to look up the k-nearest neighbors to any one point. So the method does not have to be completely lazy, but it's lazy. Which, um, how much work should you put into pre-processing the data? Is it worth doing it? Yeah? It, it depends on the application. Like for example, if you have like a self-driving car, then you want to use more eager evaluation because you know the amount of time you have to make a decision could be very, very short. So when, when it's a real-time application where you have to make the decision very quickly, then you should up front load as much of the work as possible. Yeah, that's a good, good example. Any other considerations? Yeah? You might be adding um, training data on the fly or, or frequently. And so uh -huh. if you're adding training, training data every day, then you have to do all that lazy evaluation or the eager evaluation again on the new training data. So if you uh, add training data often on an ongoing basis, then uh, eagerness might not pay off unless the eager data structure is such that it's easy to add to. And, and one other consideration I have in mind. How many test examples do you plan, you think you're gonna have in your lifetime versus how many training examples you have in a lifetime? If you're doing this whole training only for a single query that will be asked, then it doesn't make sense to do it up front. But if you're going to, this is kind of related to your point, but if you're going to, <laughs> excuse me, uh, put this, um, this function or this evaluator in some engine that's gonna be queried a billion times a day, then all of a sudden it makes a lot of sense to do a lot of pre-calculation to optimize also related to your point, to minimize the amount of work for each query because you expect to, make, to have many, many queries. So you, you may want to minimize the amount of work for each query either because you, you will have very limited time to do it or because you expect to do it many, many times. So you have some choice between lazy and eager, but the, most, the simplest implementation is very lazy. Um, let me go back to this idea of weighing. If what we're trying to capture is this notion of how does distance affect the agreement between labels or the similarity between outputs in the case of regression, um, we generalize the notion of 
distance, we can generalize the notion of distance to something else, which we'll call a kernel. A kernel, with the letter K, is a function of two inputs that tells you how much influence, or that captures how much influence you think they um, should have on one another. So these are both examples of kernels that have direct dependence on the distance. But in general, a kernel is something that maps, you can think about it as xi and x test, but you can also think about it as any two points, xa and xb. A kernel is a function uh, that maps any two potential inputs into a real number. Input one, input A, input B maps into a real number. Uh, in fact, a positive and non-negative number. It is symmetric in its inputs, namely the kernel applied to input A, input B gives the same value as the kernel applied to input B, input A. So distance has a property that it's symmetric, but other things do too. It's never negative, and it's zero if and only if the two inputs are the same. So you can think about it as a generalization of distance. For it to be a true distance measure, it also has to satisfy the triangle inequality, whereas kernels may or may not satisfy the triangle inequality, so it's not a, a complete distance. K of xA, xB equals zero if and only if xA is xB. Now we can refer to this as a Gaussian kernel. And identify this sigma as the bandwidth of the kernel. The bandwidth, bandwidth you can think of informally as the effective distance or the meaningful distance, the distance beyond which things stop being that relevant. In the case of a Gaussian, it's very closely affiliated with the standard deviation Um, because once you go two standard deviations away, the Gaussian falls very fast. But you can apply the notion of a bandwidth to kernels that are not Gaussian. For example, I can draw kind of a spherical um, bandwidth. It can look like this. And the bandwidth might be something like this. The important thing is that Things, other examples that fall within the bandwidth are relevant. If they fall far outside the bandwidth, they're not relevant. The bandwidth tells you um, what distances are important. Here is a very nice demonstration of how useful this idea of bandwidth and kernels is. This is a classic example that's used a lot in the literature. Suppose your trading examples look like this. So these are two spirals, a spiral of positive examples and a spiral of negative examples. I hope you can see my drawing here. Two spirals intertwined. If you use k nearest neighbor, or if you uh, made the dependence on distance a nice quadratic thing or one over x thing, then it would be very hard to separate the two. If you use parametric classification, for example, decide that uh, you restrict your attention to only linear separators, it's hopeless. You cannot separate this linearly, right? 
But if what you say is, I believe that the relevant distance is about this much. This is the right distance. This is the right bandwidth. I hope that's about right. <laughs> I can separate them a little more. It'll be a little easier. But let's say you say this is the right bandwidth. If you now use effectively the k-nearest neighbor method, but not with a fixed k, but weight by distance, weight by a kernel, and the kernel you use is, say, a Gaussian kernel with this bandwidth, you will get very nice classification of any new points. Because what happens is you can think about these negative points as being very close to each other, so they, um, they have a high influence on one another. So if one of them is not, is not known, all these other points would, are close enough that they matter, and they would decide the label here. And the same for the positives. But if you travel a little bit more of that distance, what you're saying is that these positives don't matter to these negatives because they're significantly longer, the distance is significantly bigger than the bandwidth. So this idea of bandwidth and this idea of a kernel allows you to create separation surfaces that are very intricate, very elaborate. And you don't need to specify them in advance. They can have curves in them. The fact that you're not specifying the family in advance is what makes it a non-parametric method. So I didn't explain why we use the term parametric. Uh, parametric methods, which is pretty much all the methods we discussed until now, are those methods where you come up with a family of solutions to start with, and the family is typically indexed by one or more parameters. So the classic example is you believe the data came from a Gaussian, but you just need to estimate the mean and the standard deviation of a Gaussian. So you boil down the problem of estimating an entire distribution to estimating two parameters. Or another example is you believe that y is a linear function of the inputs, and you just need to come up with the right betas. So linear regression is a classic parametric method because you boil down the problem of general regression from the set of all possible functions that map the axis into y into just a family of linear mappings of x into y. So you created a family. This was your hard bias, basically. And now you are learning the parameters. In non-parametric regression, you are not creating a family a priori. You are not creating a hard bias a priori. And that has the advantage that as you have more and more data points, you can make finer and finer distinctions. The, uh, how elaborate the separation barrier in the classification is will depend on how many data points you have. If you have just these two data points, a k nearest neighbor with k equals 1 would put a straight line between them. If you have a few more data points, it might create something that's effectively like this. Still smooth, as smooth as the data allows it to be. So this is somewhat similar to what we saw in neural networks when we talked about training a neural network starting from very small weights. The beauty of that was that when you have very small weights, the network is effectively implementing a linear mapping. And then as gradient descent proceeds, and the weights grow, you start seeing nonlinearities, so the decision surfaces become more curved. Something very similar happens in nonparametric learning. With very little data, the decision boundaries are fairly smooth. As you get more and more training examples, the decision boundaries adjust themselves to the training examples and can become arbitrarily complex. which is why this is not parametric, <clears throat> or it's another way of saying it's not parametric. Questions so far? <clears throat>
The idea of kernel is more general and more powerful than the idea of distance. First of all, there are a couple problems with distance. I will show you an example. Okay, how would you classify this data point here? With the k nearest neighbor, or just by common sense? Positive or negative? Positive. Positive. Why? Because it's closest to these data points, right? Now let me tell you what the dimensions are. This is the number of miles that separate the points in the north-south direction. And this is the number of millimeters, or in, let's say inches, for those of you who are so inclined, inches separating the points in the east-west direction. I just chose two different units to measure. Now, at this point, you should say, hey, that's not fair. You should use the same units, right? OK, I use the same units that basically, to turn these inches into miles, I need to compress this like this. And when I do, it would look like this. And my point will end up here. And now your answer would be negative. Right? What's the important point here? The important point here is that the dimensions matter. By stretching or compressing dimensions, we change which neighbors are near other neighbors. Other neighbors. We change who is the nearest neighbor. And the easiest way to stretch or compress a dimension is to change the units. Change it from meters to centimeters, change it for kilograms to grams, and so forth. So it's easy to say, okay, just make all distances in meters, and all weights in grams, and all times in seconds. But then how do you compare seconds to grams to meters? What if the covariates, the features, come from completely different dimensions? Suppose I have only two covariates. One is time and the other is distance. You know, one second is worth how much? Speed of light? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Einstein would say, yeah, that's what it is. Um, you see the problem. So actually, in some sense, the notion of distance is arbitrary. The way you compare distances along different dimensions to one another is somewhat arbitrary. You can effectively stretch or compress different dimensions. It's basically, it's the same as saying that this distance, which is both distance in this direction, distance in this direction, um, you need to define a um, a weight between them, a conversion between this kind of distance and this kind of distance. And you can do that. You can define a new distance measure 
Uh, I have it somewhere on the board. I'll just modify it. Here it is. All you have to do is add a weight here. Weight D. You can have it either inside the square or outside, it doesn't matter. But you add a positive weight that effectively stretches or compresses different dimensions. The problem can be, and then you need to fit those weights, right? So you need to somehow maybe train it by cross-validation on data. This is one method of doing that. Let's take one dimension at a time and change its weight gradually to maximize accuracy of your method and then move to another dimension and so forth. So you do kind of a greedy search in the space of weights. You can take this to an extreme. Some of the dimensions may be meaningless. They may not be relevant at all. Either because from what you know about the domain, they have nothing to do with whether the labels are similar or not. Or because uh, somebody just gave you 150 covariates and you don't believe that it depends on all of them. I guess it's the same thing. No, because the difference is in the first case, you know specifically which covariates you suspect to be not relevant. In the second case, you don't. If you have 150 covariates, so you're looking for a distance in 150 dimensional space, but the real similarity depends on only two or three covariates, but you don't know which. What do you think is going to happen if you use something like K nearest neighbor? You're calculating the distance between points based on this summation over 150 dimensions, 150 covariates. You have a vector of 150 values for each one of the training examples. And given a new test example, you're calculating its distance based on this. Forget about the weight. Just normally calculating the distance. But the true relationship is only based on two or three of these 150 dimensions. What's going to happen? This noise will impact the correctness. It would absolutely impact the correctness of the classification in a very bad way. Basically, the remaining 147 dimensions are going to add noise to the measurement of distance. And because there's so many of them, the measurement of distance will become almost meaningless. You'll be measuring distance along the wrong dimensions. This happens actually a lot faster than, the, you don't have to get to 150 dimensions. Even with 10 dimensions, if a few of them are not relevant, <coughs> that can severely distort or introduce noise to your measure of distance. And you won't know that unless you do one of two things. Either you know something about the domain and you preclude some of the dimensions to start with. That means bringing outside knowledge. That's bias, inductive bias. The second thing you can do, you can try to learn those weights from data. The problem with learning them from data, which is, um, is that the amount of data you would need to effectively estimate the effect of each one of the dimensions would grow exponentially with the number of dimensions. This dependence often goes by the curse word the curse of dimensionality this is a problem that plagues non-parametric methods Non-parametric methods suffer very much when the number of dimensions increase. And it's kind of easy to see why. If you have a parametric method that's based on, say, a Gaussian assumption, the number of parameters needed to specify a Gaussian in d dimensions is? Sorry? Two to the power of d, no. The number of parameters that I need to specify a multivariate Gaussian in d dimensions is about d squared. You have to specify the mean, which is d parameters, 
and the covariance matrix, which is d squared. If you're trying to, to um, specify a hyperplane in d dimensions, how many parameters do you need? d plus 1. Okay, line, two parameters, right? So the number of parameters you need grows linearly or quadratically in the number of dimensions. But if you don't make parametric assumptions, you're relying on the data. And when data is distributed in d dimensions, it tends to be, become very, very sparse, very, very fast. Let's assume for simplicity that every dimension has only a zero and a one. So you have a hypercube. A hypercube with d dimensions has two to the d vertices. So the number of distinctions you need to make grows exponentially in number of dimensions. This is the price we pay for, non for being non-parametric. Otherwise, why not always be non-parametric? So non-parametric methods are, have a very high expressive power. They can express just about anything if you give them enough data. Right? Even something as simple as k nearest neighbor, let's say three nearest neighbor, if you now fill the board full with labeled examples, just go to infinity with as many labeled examples as you need, the k nearest neighbor will be able to um, draw very elaborate um, bo decision boundaries. There's really no a priori limit to how elaborate they are. They can, be, they can change at a very fine scale, which you cannot do with parametric methods. So parametric methods have potentially a very, very high expressive power. Is that a good thing? Is it good for a method to have high expressive power? You are overwhelmingly uncertain. Depends on if you can actually use the method. Like, if you have a really high expression power, but it takes you forever to compute the answer, then it's not a useful method. If it takes you forever to compute the answer, it's not a useful method. Yes, but I'd like to leave computational considerations alone. <coughs> Is it good for the purpose of accuracy for a method to have high expressive power? Yes. Anybody disagrees? Could this cause uh, overfitting? It could cause overfitting. So the correct answer is it depends. Um, high expressive power means low inductive bias, very little bias. That's not necessarily a good thing. It's only a good thing if you don't know what bias to impose. High expressive power means you're making fewer assumptions you can get by with making fewer assumptions if you have a ton of data. But if you don't have a ton of data, you can't. Remember, you have to have at least some assumptions and the, the, and the sum of the strength of the assumptions and the amount of data you have has to be enough to do the learning. So non-parametric methods are reasonable things to think about when you can't think of strong parametric assumptions to make that you feel comfortable about, and you have a lot of data. If you have relatively little data, you really don't have a choice. Non-parametric methods will not work very well. So you can say that non-parametric methods have, in general, weaker bias. Their bias is not expressed in terms of a hard bias of a set, a priori set, but it's expressed in pretty much in this picture. It's expressed in saying that nearby points tend to have similar values. And what we mean by nearby and how similar relative to nearby is captured by this picture. So we were talking about the, the problem with the straight out distance measure, 
And so we switch to a kernel measure. And the examples of kernel that I gave you were all dependent on a notion of a Cartesian, a Cartesian distance. You first calculate a Cartesian distance between points, and then you pass it through either a Gaussian or something else. But kernel is much broader than that. You can apply kernel to measure the um, effect, to calculate the effect that you think point should, uh, one input should have and another input, even when there's no clear measure of distance between them. For example, your inputs might be graphs, they might be images, they might be sound bites, they might be documents, where you, let's say, documents. You could think of mapping a document to a point in, in Cartesian space and then calculate a distance, but that would be somewhat arbitrary. What you really care about is, what is how similar are these two documents? And you can capture that notion of similarity with, directly with a kernel whose input are two documents. So kernels are much more general functions than just distance. You have the input one, or input A, input B. There's a class of kernels that is particularly useful. They're called Mercer kernels. Mercer kernels are those kernels that, um, when expressed as a matrix, are a positive semi-definite uh, I'm sorry, definite, positive semi-definite matrix, meaning uh, that the eigenvalues are not negative. If you don't know your linear algebra, uh, a positive semi-definite matrix is the generalization from real numbers of a non-negative number. So a non-negative number is an example of a positive semi-definite uh, matrix of dimension one. Another way of thinking of positive semi-definite matrices is matrices that multiply everything in a positive direction by a positive amount. They never do inversion. The reason Mercer kernels are particularly useful is because you can take let me first write positive. By the way, the semi part, uh, if you drop that, you get positive definite. That, means, that corresponds to a matrix whose eigenvalues are all strictly positive. So the semi part is the one that is analogous to saying greater than or equal zero, as opposed to greater than zero. Uh, the reason Mercer kernels are useful is because you can take any two objects they could be documents, images, trees, whatever, and represent them by a feature vector, potentially very large feature vector. And then any um, Mercer kernel over these uh, objects, let's say documents, is equivalent to some feature representation of these objects and then the kernel becomes an inner product of the feature representation. So let me put it in writing. Let's say document A is represented as feature one um, of document A through feature N of document A. And similarly, document B is represented as a set of features of document B. Same feature family applied to the two different documents. If I now take the inner product of the feature vectors applied to document A and applied to document B, This defines for me a kernel between document A 
in document B. And it's a Mercer kernel. It is positive semi-definite. But the opposite is also true. Every time you can find a, you define a kernel function over some space and you uh, show that it's a Mercer kernel, that means there is a set of features, of feature functions, that that kernel is cal calculating the inner product of. So this goes in both directions. Why is that useful? Sometimes we're in a situation where simple separability does not exist. Linear separability does not exist, but you suspect that quadratic separability exists, or some other more elaborate higher dimensional separability exists. One common trick we use is to take the original space in which the data points are represented and project it into a higher dimensional space where they do become linearly separable. Why do we care about that? Because we have many efficient methods for finding linear separations uh, when they exist or approximately exist. So in this case, if we use as features not only the x1 values and x2 values, but also x1 times x2 or x1 squared, so this is x1, this is x2. If we use these as features, um, we are effectively mapping this two-dimensional picture into a one, two, three, four-dimensional picture in this case. And in that, in that four-dimensional space, a, a, a um, linear separating line would correspond to this quadratic line. So far, we don't need the kernel, we just do the mapping. Now, if we can come up with a kernel that has these components as its equivalent features, we can just apply the kernel as opposed to do this calculation of the features. So uh, a very commonly used kernel is called the polynomial kernel. I would do it in, in terms of x and y. The distance between the vector x and the vector y is, let's say, 1 plus um, would be x times y, x minus y. x t y to the some power, let's say, um, to take it to power 3 here. Or even simpler, I'll make it power 2. This is a um, kernel that applies to two vectors in some, let's say, small dimensional space like this one, two dimensions. But when you open these parentheses, you're going to get many more terms. In this case, you're going to get uh, 1 plus um, x1, y1 plus x2, y2. So x, t, y x d y is uh, x1, x2, sorry, x1, x2 times y1, y2. So that's x1, y1 plus x2, y2. This is the inner product of these two. Um, 
So you're going to get that squared um, and then that would open to 1 plus 2x1 y1 plus um, 2x2 y2 plus x1 squared y1 squared plus x2 y2 squared um, and the more terms. So basically you get a very long list of uh, terms uh, of different combinations which is effectively the same as taking these original data points and throwing them to higher dimensions. But you don't need to do this calculation, you can just apply this kernel. So by applying this kernel, and you can put a higher dimension here, you have even more terms. By applying this kernel, you are allowing the separation barrier to be in a much higher dimensional space, to involve implicitly many uh, quadratic or third order terms of the, X, and, of the uh, X1 and X2, of the different dimensions. Sorry, this is not a fully worked out example, but let me just give you the, the um, take home message here. Kernels can express Um, elaborate, oops, I'm keeping you too long. Elaborate, by this I mean typically high dimensional relationships in a compact form. This very simple looking kernel uh, is, uh, has the same effect as mapping the data to a much higher dimensional space and then looking for a linear separation there. I should let you go. I will see you hopefully on Friday.